Hey, everyone. Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to Live from NYPL. I am Faye Rosenfeld, and I am the Vice President of Public Programs here at the New York Public Library. And whether you're watching us online, which I know many hundreds of you are, or you're with us in the room, again, many hundreds of you are here, um, we are so, so happy that you've joined us. Um, speaking of being happy, tonight I am very, very happy to have the pleasure of introducing the fabulous Lynn Slater. Um, she is here. She's here to talk about her new book, How to Be Old, Lessons in Living Boldly from the Accidental Icon. Uh, Lynn's book is a beautifully written account of her personal and, I have to say, rather magical uh, journey of reinvention, a journey that's taken her from Fordham professor and social worker to blogger, influencer, world-famous fashion icon, and as of today, a newly published memoirist. Uh, <laughs> And the, and the book is also a kind of roadmap for people of all ages, one that guides us towards living the best years of our lives, the years when we are old, just as Lynn does, with authenticity, creativity, happiness, and of course, impeccable style. Um, I, just, I just love this book. I highlighted so many pages, um, and we are so, so grateful to Lynn for giving us the honor of launching it into the world with her. Joining Lynn in conversation this evening is another brilliant professor, author, and memoirist, Chloe Cooper-Jones. Chloe's uh, memoir, Easy Beauty, was named a best book of 2022 by the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, and Time Magazine, and it was a finalist for the 2023 Pulitzer Prize in memoir, and we are so, so thrilled to have her back with us at Live. Hey, Chloe. Copies of How to Be Old are available for sale uh, from the library shop right here, and purchases made here benefit the New York Public Library. Uh, Lynn will be doing a signing afterwards, so please stick around for that. And of course, you can also check out a copy of the book uh, from any of your branch libraries or online uh, using our Simply E app, and all you need for that is your library card, which, of course, everyone in this room has, right? Yes, okay, just checking. Okay, um, I, I'm gonna bring Lynn and Chloe on stage in just a minute, um, but since we are in the middle of Women's History Month and we have two fantastic women here, I'm gonna take a moment to mention some of the other extraordinary women um, who will be joining us at Live later this season. They include Hillary Clinton, Jennifer Weiner, Kara Walker, Jamaica Kincaid, Marilyn Robinson, Ayanna Mathis, Emily Wins Wilson, Hanya Yanagihara, and Maggie Haberman, to name just a few. Um, yeah, it's amazing. And we, of course, have some pretty terrific men, too. Uh, Colm Toybean, Justice Stephen Breyer, Neil Mukherjee, Sasha Isenberg, Michael Stipe, Suketu Mehta, and Stephen Kotkin. Um, we are super excited about all these events. We hope to see you at many of them. Um, if, if not all. And I also want to tell you about a really wonderful exhibition that we have opening here this Friday. And the exhibition is entitled The Awe of the Arctic, A Visual History. If you happen to walk around the building tonight before coming down to this program, you may have seen some of the images already installed or being installed. Curated by our wonderful uh, NYPL colleagues, Elizabeth Cronin and Maggie Mustard, the exhibition is a multi-part survey of how the Arctic has been visually depicted, defined, and imagined over the past 500 years. And to celebrate the opening this Friday evening, we are holding one of my absolute favorite events of the year, although I really do love them all. Um, it's called the Library After Hours. This is a night when we keep the entire uh, all three floors of this gorgeous building open late. We fill it with all kinds of activities inspired by the exhibitions. We'll have screenings of rare 16 millimeter films from our exhibition, from our um, collections. Um, we'll have uh, talks by some of the artists featured in the show. We'll have music in the beautiful Rosemain Reading Room. We'll have dancing under the Northern Lights. We'll have all kinds of fun things. So please come uh, join us. We, we hope to see many of you there. Um, so for information about everything that we have going on to sign up, you can just go to nypl.org slash love. Live. All of our programs are made possible thanks to the generosity of Celeste Bartos, Adam Bartos, and Manaz Ispahani Bartos, and of course, um, all of you, our loyal patrons and friends near and far. And we cannot thank you enough for that support. It means so much, and it is especially critical for us right now, um, as the library faces the possibility of a staggering $58.3 million in cuts to our budget. Um, these are the largest cuts to city funding in over a decade. They are on top of cuts that we already absorbed earlier in the year um, that force us to eliminate many of our services um, that are so vital to our communities. So if you'll indulge me for just one additional second, I want to really ask for your help. In your program, you'll see a QR code. 
uh, please scan it or you can go directly to nypl.org slash speak out nypl.org slash speak out. This will take you to a letter that you can sign asking the mayor and city leaders to restore library funding. Um, so just thank you so much in advance for signing that and for all that you all do uh, to help keep our libraries open and available for all. Okay, <laughs> back to the show. Lynn and Chloe are uh, gonna speak for about 45 minutes and then they will take your questions. If you're here in the room, you'll see note cards on your seats. Um, you can just write your questions uh, on the cards and some of one of my wonderful colleagues will come around and collect the questions from you. If you're joining us online, you can drop your questions into the chat um, or send us an email at publicprograms at nypl.org. They will get to as many questions as they can and now, Please welcome Lynn Slater and Chloe Cooper-Jones. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Chloe. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, <laughs> this is an amazing crowd. Um, and yeah, all here for such an incredible reason to celebrate this phenomenal book and Lynn Slater. So um, I'm just so honored to get to talk to you and be in conversation. And I want to just start with a sort of grounding question. Now, um, I'm sure that everybody in this room knows all about you and all about the accidental icon and everybody on the live stream, but just, just on the off chance that somebody doesn't know or they're new to the wonder that is Lynn Slater, um, could you just give a brief you know, explanation of how you became the accidental icon and then how that led you to this book? Ah, so, um... I had turned 60, and I was at a crossroads where I was feeling a little bored with what I was doing, and I wanted to do something different, and I've had this lot, lifelong habit of, you know, going and taking continuing ed classes or putting myself into a different experience, and I was... You know, as my body was changing as an older woman, I started to get more interested in clothing. And I never um, really was about fashion. I was about clothes and the power of clothes to express your identity. So I wanted to, like, really dive into this. And I had also seen the power that can come uh, that is attached uh, to clothing. And so I just started taking classes at FIT. It was just sort of, okay, this will be fun. It will be different. I was the oldest person in every class. Um, but I took a class called Building Your Vintage Business. And there was an extraordinary professor. She did, um, she was a, a real pioneer in fashion sustainability. And she um, had this amazing uh, thing that she would do where she would take apart clothes and put them together in a new and different way. And, and this concept fascinated me. And so as this was going on, people started coming up to me and saying, you have amazing style. You should start a fashion blog. And, you know, I had said, oh, maybe I'll be a jewelry designer or a fashion designer. But, you know, you realize, okay, to get good at that, it's going to take several years. So I, I wanted to do something now. There was, like, this urgency. And so I said, you know what? I could do that. I know how to write. I'm a professor. I can research. I know how to make my own website. And I just decided to do it. And I started writing. I had a lot of consignment store clothes. My partner, Calvin, um, would take my picture. We would go out in all of these funky neighborhoods, nowhere glamorous. In fact, many of my you know, early photos, you'll see garbage around my feet. Um, but I was just having a ball. Yeah. And it was just exploring a whole new world 
And I really didn't have any intention or goals. You know, I've been in social work my whole life. I had no idea that you could make money from a fashion blog or, or anything like that. And so I was just doing it for pleasure. And I, I do have to say that anything really surprising and wonderful and crazy in my life has always happened when I'm not trying. Mm -hmm. And when I'm trying, it doesn't always quite <laughs> come to me the way that I would like. So I just started putting myself out there. I was chasing whatever seemed fun. Mm -hmm. I did music videos. Um, I played Charlotte Gainsbourg's older self in, <laughs> in a, a fabulous music video with Dev Hines. Mm -hmm. I did one with ASAP Rocky. <laughs> and so, um, and not being paid for any of it, just having a really good time. And I showed up for this casting call um, that someone told me about. And it ended up being for a Valentino eyewear ad. And they basically said, you know, if we use your picture, we'll pay you like $1,000 or some fee like that. And, and I was like, whatever. And then a few months after, they said, we're going to use the photo. And then two months after that, I started to get texts, and my friends were going crazy, and they said, you're in a full-page ad in every fashion magazine no. that yeah. exists. Yeah. And from that, I got a modeling agent, and then after that, it went completely insane in, in yeah. ways, as you'll discover in the book, that I didn't always intend. Yeah, and we're going to talk, you know, we're going to get there for sure. It's, I have all these questions that I wrote in this book, but I have to fight the urge right now to not just um, throw all these questions out and ask you for, like, celebrity gossip or, <laughs> you know, like, to get the tea on ASAP Rocky or something. Um, but I, but I'll, we'll save that for after. Um, well, I can tell you that oh. they shoot music videos at 5 o'clock in the morning or 4 o'clock in the morning. It's not like regular business hours. <laughs> How was that? For you. We're like hanging out in a Brooklyn bodega at 3 a.m. <laughs> <That's> amazing. <laughs> I've had that dream, I think, once. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, one thing you talk about, there's so many different, I think, themes and ideas that, that recur in this book. One is just um, the idea of repurposing. You know, you're talking about taking this vintage class and, and this theme of repurposing or making new and then later on in the book, um, that gets turned into a sort of metaphor around seam ripping, what it means to do some seam ripping and metaphorically in your life. And there's one particular passage, um, you know, you didn't read out loud for us, but I've got many passages <laughs> marked, so, so we will get a taste of your um, writing during this. But one of the passages, you, I think the writing about clothes in this book is incredible, by the way. Um, I feel like I think about clothes so differently after having read just your descriptions of them, which is such an incredibly powerful thing. I think it's one of the hardest things for a writer to do, to take a visual medium and make it more vibrant and more, um, like, it, just to, to break it down as beautifully as you do in this book. So one of those examples is you're talking very early on about this class that you take at FIT, and about vintage clothing, and you write, and I'm sort of paraphrasing from my notes, that you wonder about how vintage clothes are so n valued for their narrative stamina, which I think is a fantastic phrase, but people are not always. Um, and I wondered if you would talk about that, that sort of gap between the ways in which you discovered this, this complete sort of almost arbitrary and, 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 and unequal um, valuing of some narrative stamina in some parts of our lives and then the devaluing of it when it comes maybe specifically to women's bodies. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, in writing a memoir, you always have the opportunity to go back and sort of see why you were doing the things you were doing that you weren't maybe knowing at the time. And I think that going to take a class about vintage and about a um, sort of whole world that values oldness, 
that I think unconsciously I was starting to have anxiety mm -hmm. about my body becoming older, about becoming an older woman. Um, and so it was just a delight to be around people and objects that really valued the beauty of things that over time, right, accrue so much memory and so much meaning. And I think we often think of aging as subtraction. You're going to lose this, you're going to lose that. But in this way, it's additive. Mm -hmm. It's about everything that you've gained over time. You know, like a beautiful, beautifully worn sort of cotton shirt that is almost threadbare, but it's so soft and it's so beautiful. And I think, you know, that was my attraction to it at yeah. the time. Yeah, and, and also early on in the book, you make a sort of subtle distinction, but I think it's this distinction for me holds sort of some of the the real magic of like, not just your career, but who you are and how you've moved through the world. And this distinction is between the difference between growth and newness. So the way that I understood it, and again, I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing it is like, you talk about growth as this opportunity to build on what you have, to build on maybe the skills that you already have, to, to identify where one is comfortable and can sort of level up in their life. But newness is in, in certain aspects of your story about, and you were saying this right at the beginning, br just absolutely breaking new trail, going to a place that you have never been in, a place that maybe you've even felt afraid to, to enter and saying like, all right, what's, what's here? And I think that a lot of what, um, it seems like people have responded so, so deeply in your work is, is your embrace of both of those, th of mm -hmm. these things. Can you speak a little bit about that distinction between growth and newness and yeah, how you've embraced both of them and if one has been harder than the other? Well, I think for me that I have to have the newness to instigate the growth. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I get to these plateau points in my everyday life where I have um, reached this certain place and I start to feel bored and I get irritable and I'm sort of in this, mm, I need something but I don't know what it is. And it needs to be different than what I'm doing all the time. And that's not devaluing my, what I'm doing in my everyday life. It's valuable and wonderful, but I just seem to have always had this need for when I'm feeling like that, some kind of stimulation. Mm. And that's what the newness is. It's about, you know, I want to know something I didn't know before. I want to do something I didn't do before. And in that process, I will grow and I will learn something new and it will take my life to a different place. Yeah. So as your, as your blog grows, as your Instagram followers grow, um, you write about, especially in the beginning of the book, and, and you do write about how this, this conversation grows more nuanced over time, but you talk about in the beginning of the book that um, quite often what you're seeing most regularly in terms of commenters, or at one point you say, if I ever wrote a book, you know, what, what, what might you want to read about? And you say that one of the most overwhelmingly popular answers is um, from, your, from your followers is about invisibility mm -hmm. and a feeling for many reasons um, you know, many different factors create this sort of sensation, especially maybe in women's lives, of feeling invisible. And age is part of it, but as you write in the book, it's, it's not limited to age. There are all these different factors that cre can create this sort of feeling of invisibility. And I think a lot of people look to you as sort of 
you know, you're, you have our answers for, for how to not um, stay invisible or to sort of regain a sort of agency around visibility. Do you think you could say a little bit about, you know, what is this invisibility that people are experiencing and talking to you about? And how have you responded to this, to them, yeah? I, I think, you know, we have, Right now, it's so hard not to internalize all of the standards and yardsticks of society because it's constantly on our screen and we're constantly seeing it. And it's almost like this um, sort of, uh, I'm, I'm not, sort of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh, when you're an old woman, you're going to be invisible. And then what I've found is that you start almost acting that way. You, you accept that role. And I, in talking with a lot of women and asking for very specific examples when they have felt invisible, um, many times I find that we, myself included, can collude in that invisibility when we do not speak. And I think it changed over time because the first time I asked that question was probably around 2018. And it was overwhelmingly like, we want to be seen. And I, I think, you know, when I first started in the early years, that was the transgressive moment. Hmm. Because in the same year, Joan Didion appeared in a Celine ad, and that's when I had my Valentino eyewear ad. And it was really the first time that older women appeared in something for a major, big fashion brand. And so in that moment, it was new. It was something that a lot of women saw and said, oh, we're not invisible. And over time, as society tends to do, you know, they're kind of like, whoops, that's, they're stepping out of the box. We have to come back and put them in, a la instagram and Oh, no. <laughs> yes. That's a thing? Oh, senior influencer, instagram oh, no. Instagram. Right. No. And and ironically, in the same <laughs> headline, they're saying, "Oh, look at them breaking stereotypes," but we're going to refer to them with stereotypes. So that was one of my moments when I refused to participate in interviews, being a big cheerleader to be an Instagramma, and I kind of said, "I'll come on your TV show." but you have to let me talk about how ageist and sexist mm -hmm. the language you're using to describe us is. And of course, no one, no one yeah, agreed. Yeah, we clap for that. Well, yeah. actually one, MSNBC, they came to my house and filmed on my lawn and let me go off on my diatribe. But yeah, so I think, I think it's changed over time. I, now I'm finding, and profoundly during this experience, I've been liking my invisibility. Oh, interesting. Well, you, you, you say, I'm going to push you to say more about that because there's, there's several points in the book where it's, you'll say like, I wanted to be visibly invisible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or at one point you, as you're sort of grappling with this new sort of, you know, visibility, um, you say it's important for us to ask our question, um, who do we really want to see us and why? Yes. And so, yeah, I'm very curious, like, how has that shifted for you? Uh, what, you you're on the stage saying you feel like you want to be invisible? No. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's, no. Uh, how are you I, navigating? I mean, in it? this process, because yeah. I've sort of been, you know, retired from the public eye, you know, I still have my Instagram, but not the big... Today Show stuff that I was doing, and I've actually loved it. And I've just loved being embedded in my new community and being seen by, you know, my neighbors and um, not having to, to worry about going out in the street and having someone say, oh, 
your accidental icon. Mm. I follow you. Can I ta take a selfie? And I've just been to the dermatologist and had all my <laughs> precancerous, you know, cells <laughs> burnt off. But I always tried to be gracious, and I would say, yes, of course, thank you for following me. Um, because my followers are amazing, as you could see. Yeah, obviously, yeah. They have been with me through all of the pivots, the ups and downs. They are the ones who encouraged me to write a book, and so they are the best part of social media. Definitely. Amidst all the other bad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wonder if you if you could answer just if succinctly, like besides the, your amazing um, followers, like when you started this, who did you know? You asked that question in the book. I think it's a really powerful question. Who do we want to be visible to, and why? Who was it, you know, when you were sixty one and started sixty sixty one, starting all of this, and who is it now? Well, interestingly, I didn't start it to be visible, Yeah, right? Yeah. And I think even for me to have to take a photograph, I had to wear sunglasses. And that mm -hmm. was even with my life partner yeah. taking my photo. Um, I was never comfortable, but I was wanted to show the clothes. I wanted to show how the clothes could look and it was an expression of what I was doing at that time because I was really researching fashion and I was meeting designers and some of them were giving me clothes and I wanted to put their stuff in the world and, you know, sort of acknowledge them and their inspiration and the beautiful clothing that they were making. And so it was not, I, I was more other directed and into the moment and the process than thinking that I was being seen, yeah. if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And so over time, you know, once 2017 happened, I was being, all of a sudden being seen by many, 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 many people. And... Um, I think the way I coped with that was to make accidental icon more like a performance mm. than sort of my true self, who was still, you know, living in my little apartment, cleaning my bathroom, babysitting my granddaughter. And I kept that identity very private and close to myself. Well, yeah, we were just talking about this before we came out. Um, you know, something that I noticed right away in this book is, and you were discussing this with me, is when, you were, when you're talking in the book about the accidental icon, you refer to her in the third person as if she is not you. She's someone you're observing almost. And there's a particular passage that I was saying was really heartbreaking to me, which, and, and, and just complex, because it represents change, both in all its greatness and, and difficulty. But you're referring to the accidental icon in this third person, and you're talking about how your partner, Calvin, used to take all of her pictures, but now as, you're, as the demands of being the icon have, have grown, you are now outsourcing that to fashion photographers or other people. And so what was once like this deeply personal project in which you refer at the end of the book of, to Calvin as a silent partner in has to change. And also you, you relate a similar sort of painful change with moving from controlling everything on your website on Squarespace yes. or, yeah, to, you know, letting someone else sort of redesign this brand. And so those growing pains also sort of tell the story of, a narrative that you build, but also start to lose control of a little bit. Absolutely. And so can you talk a little bit about both both that process of losing control of that narrative, and then we'll talk about how you how you get it back, but or they'll have to buy the book, and then you'll find out how, <laughs> how, you, how you get it back. But also just that formal decision in the writing of the book to distance yourself in some ways from, from that performance. Because in the early years of it, it was a very coherent self. 
it was me going to that fashion class. It was me talking, going to the market shows and talking to these young designers. And then once it took the turn, it became this other person. And maybe that's how I coped with it. Mm. But it became no longer about me at my core. And it's so interesting because in between when I started doing most of my work on Instagram and I was doing tons of sponsored posts, like in between, I would post photos that Calvin took of me. Mm -hmm. And of course, those always got thousands more likes, right, than the other ones. And so, you know, it had been this thing that Calvin and I were doing, and then it became something else. And it was, you know, in retrospect, I look back and all during the early years until 2019, I was still teaching full time. So I have one foot in a classroom, in a social work classroom, mm -hmm. which is really about real life in all its manifestations and then doing Accidental Icon. But after I retired from academia in 2019, it was almost as though I sort of fell into the digital world and got lost in it. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't have enough of myself in the real world to keep me in balance. Yeah, and the arc of the book takes us very deep into the natural world, which I found such a beautiful sort of part of this book, which, well, I don't, I don't, how are we on time? I don't want to jump ahead to the end. Maddie, what time is it? Do you know? I don't have a timer anymore. I just want, I have so many questions. I don't want to jump to the end before we, I know that everybody else has a lot of questions too. What do we got? Great. Oh, we have so much. Okay, okay. good, good. Well, so before we get to the end in the natural world and all these things, um, I wanted to say something that is still sort of in the sort of center of the book. And I think it's the thing that, that sort of moved me the most and, and or, or I think actually sort of challenged me the most in the book. And you and I were talking about this a little bit backstage. Um, as a, you know, as I'm a disabled woman who lives in a body that doesn't get seen much in, in the fashion world. Um, most sort of fashion doesn't seem as though it's made for me or, or bodies like mine. And so I think I've felt a sort of um, perpetual distance from fashion being, you know, possible in any sort of way uh, for me to like connect to in a sort of meaningful way. And something you talked about in the book is that there's a, you know, a, a sort of mythology that's built around fashion. And that can be both a self-perpetuating mythology from within that system, but also one that we bring to it, right? That it's like one of our own burdens that we put onto that art form. And I think something that was so powerful to me about this book was you're sort of asking in many different ways, explicitly and implicitly throughout the book, like, why, why, why are you, anyone, when any of us, excluding ourselves from the world of personal style? Like, what is it that you think um, is happening there that you don't, you don't belong there? And you talk very vulnerably about moments, especially early on, in which the rarefied air of fashion makes you even question whether or not you belong. And so, I think that's probably something a lot of people here can identify with, this sort of feeling of not being certain that a world um, like fashion or any, you know, or other ones we may want to belong to would ever welcome us in. And yet, I think you, you know, you navigate this somehow <laughs> quite bravely and quite brilliantly. And I wonder if you could talk about just moments where you felt less badass or less sure and how you how you moved beyond that fear to really embody not just not just the fashion world, but I think more profoundly, such a deep sense of your own style. Well, I think because I always distinguished between fashion and personal style, and fashion and clothing. And so for me, 
I very much view clothes as a material available to us mm. to express our identity, to play with possible selves and identities. And that has nothing to do with fashion or the fashion system. And, and I've actually come to a point now after watching countless runway shows um, that fashion is really about newness, it's about youth, it's about you know, standards of youth and beauty. And for that reason, I don't think it's ever gonna be transgressive. <laughs> and so I've decided I am going to let it inspire me. Yeah. And I had a conversation with someone the other day about, you know, even when they are showing older women now on the runway, they're still tall, they're still thin, they're still mostly white, and probably former supermodels. And so women are not seeing themselves, yeah. right? So I think we have to stop looking at the women and look at the clothes. And decide what do we want to express about ourselves through what we put on our body mm. in terms of who we are, who we would like to be, and then look at garments from that perspective. So as long as you're doing it from that internal place, right, you're not preoccupied with the external, which is in your face now on Instagram and social media and you're constantly comparing and looking and seeing and, you know, fashion says this is the standard. And so I think, again, if you think of them as a creative material, and I, I wrote an essay on my sub, sub stack recently, which is a great uh, metaphor for all of this, but Helmut Lang, who is a designer I always loved, at the height of his career, he quit because he always wanted to be an artist. Mm. And he had given away some of his collection to museums and fashion schools, but his archive he kept in Soho in, in this loft and there was a fire and it was all burnt and destroyed. And what he did is he took, took it, he put it in an industrial shredder and he created these amazing sculptures out of it. Wow. And I went to see that exhibit. And when you c get up close to it, you can see the little bits of feathers and a label and denim, but it looks from afar like a forest. Mm. And one of the things that you know he talks about is this creative destruction. And so, I think that's just such a great metaphor for being able to, it, it actually helped me retreat from looking at runway shows. And, and interestingly, I never did look at runway shows for most of my life. I was always just looking and feeling my clothes and are you saying what I want you to say about me? Yeah. And it was only until I got into this realm that I started going to runway shows or even being interested in them. And initially it was exciting. I saw many beautiful things. And now I can look at a fashion show. And even though none of the women look like me or I can't probably fit into most of those clothes, I can be inspired by them. And there was a Prada show uh, a couple of years ago, and it was just this host of, tra of women who were traveling. And there were like little bags and pouches and watches on their belt. And that just informed my style for like a year mm -hmm. because I wanted to be a traveling woman. I didn't need to wear a Prada to be a traveling woman. And so that I've sort of put fashion in its place because I truly don't believe it's ever going to get to that point where it's gonna be sustainable, it's gonna be inclusive. 
especially now because of who's running it, which are large conglomerates and not really designers anymore. Yeah. I think that one of the, the greatest strengths of this book is the way that you very openly talk about mistakes that you've made um, and own them, or at least moments of great complexity that you've had to face and you face head on. I think there's a version of this book that you could have written that would have been much safer and, um, you know, much more flattering that would have just been like, I don't know, I look great in clothes and I've, <laughs> like, I have a lot of followers, you know, like, and we would have bought that and, and, and loved it. Um, but this book goes so far beyond that in, in that it has an incredible arc where at sort of the height of um, a lot of what, you know, we might call success, um, you're in a campaign that causes some controversy that you, I think, handle so brilliantly, but it, it begins to ask, it begins to force you to ask some questions about how how many people are sort of involved in your narrative now and how it's like being loosened from from this sort of personal world. And so, you know, the, the campaign has um, you saying some uh, a sentence, age is an illusion, and some people find great inspiration in that, but others feel that it's um, in some ways erasing their experiences. And one of the things that I really admire about this book is that you discuss that and you discuss the incredibly generative conversations that you have with the people that, that are pushing back against this. But then it also leads you to reflect and sort of step away um, and sort of begin a new chapter of, of your life. And this book really, it takes such a beautiful turn and, and I think what's just the final full chapter about your home and peak skill and all these sort of moving away from descriptions of clothes and, and experiences in social media and all these things to the natural world and the life that you're building, you know, in your overalls and, and in your beautiful house. So could you sort of talk about that, maybe that particular moment or, or, or the cluster of moments that feel like a big turning point in you understanding your narrative shifting and how you feel like you accomplished a, a sort of regaining of that narrative, but in a new, in a new place. Mm -hmm. I think um, what I was feeling at the worst right before the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. And when the pandemic hit, there's no more influencing work, right? Everything stops. Fashion is on its knees. And I had enormous amounts of time that the year prior, I was literally living on my phone and living on social media and engaging and doing content and being crazy and not having time to think and really sucked into the whole thing. And I knew I was unhappy on some level. And so um, what ended up happening was the pandemic happened. And it really gave me a moment of freedom in a way, despite all of the tragedy of it, to really begin to understand what had happened to me. And I began to do that through writing. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that had happened to me is I had stopped writing my blog and did most of my work on Instagram. And so, I began to write during the pandemic and I began to write about my feelings about the environment and how fashion was contributing to that and how I was feeling about this and you know how I was feeling helpless and um, you know not being able to be a social worker at this time and lots of vulnerabilities and feeling guilty about how much I love clothes and a lot of women were resonating with mm. that. And they were saying, I love clothes, it's how I express myself, but now it feels like I have to give them up. And w the way that I phrased it is, well, we just have to change our relationship with them. And again, I started becoming me. Mm -hmm. And I wrote about my real feelings, about not seeing my mother, about not seeing my family, 
I started to change how I wrote on Instagram. I did like little mini blogs. I started to tell stories from when I was a kid. I wrote about my mother a lot because one of the things that really had gotten me was that I missed her 90th birthday because I was traveling. And so um, re-engaging with the writing and I've always, I mean, I have journals through my lifetime and I've always used writing as a way to think. And so I sort of just really started through the writing feeling me return to myself and not seeing my daughter and not seeing my granddaughter and my mother and just being trapped in this 600 square foot apartment for those months. You know, we had a roof that we could go to, but it was like one person at a time. And so it just happened. We weren't even planning it. We weren't even thinking about it. One night I just said to Calvin, I said, you know what? I think we could move. <laughs> I, think, I think we could do it. And he said, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah. And he's right, all right, let's do it. And so that's when we started to look outside the city. Calvin was still working. And he did continue to work for a year after we moved. But, you know, we found this, like, sort of unwanted house in Peekskill. Um, it had been on the market for a while at a time when everything else was disappearing in a day. But we knew it was the right house for us. Mm -hmm. And so um, once I got into that space and once I got back into nature and once I sort of reclaimed my real life mm -hmm. and got out of the digital life, I really began to realize what had happened to me and how I didn't want to return to it, but more importantly, I discovered the pleasure and how much I really did love to write. Well, that's a great segue to, we now have some audience questions. Uh -huh. And the first one that I have is about writing, so perfect. It's, um, how has your academic and professional background influenced you um, as a writer, and how did you manage combining those fields? Because yes, you come from a very different academic style of writing, and and so yeah, how did you sort of marry those worlds? And some of my favorite scenes in the book are you sort of toggling between those? Yes, definitely. Yeah. So I think you know I was thinking about writing initially as an either-or proposition that it was either academic or creative writing, and just as a backstory. From the time I've been a young woman, whenever I had a moment to take a creative writing class, I did. And uh, particularly when I turned 40 and I moved to New York City after having separated from my husband, I was taking a ton of writing classes and doing a lot of writing. So that was always happening. And one of the challenges I had in academia was I hated the way that you had to write as an academic. Yeah. I don't like being controlled. <laughs> and it felt very controlling. Yeah. Getting my dissertation done was the biggest nightmare of my life. And I had the good fortune of getting my doctorate at CUNY Graduate Center. And our discipline made us take electives in other disciplines as part of getting our PhD. And so I started to take like creative research methods where these people were doing performative writing and they were incorporating video into their research and they were doing all of this creative stuff. And I wanted to do that kind of writing for my dissertation, but head of chair said negative because um, it's a very traditional yeah. field. So I reluctantly got through that. But I did write kind of a creative 
academic book with an attorney, um, which is technically a tech book, textbook, but it doesn't read like a textbook. And so I think I was always challenging that. And one of the things I've discovered in my writing life now is that I've discovered this form called the hybrid or the braided essay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to enter into something, you know, in a with a very creative personal story or a piece of creative writing. But then you can access research to look at the bigger ideas. And so I feel like, ah, oh, I'm, I'm like coherent as a writer in this form because I do love research. I love ideas. Yeah. And so that's why I love that form. And so I feel like I have found the good marriage mm. between sort of academic writing and creative writing in that form of writing. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I love this question. Um, what roles do discernment and discipline play in finding a path to follow when trying all the new or new things to get to the next level of growth? I think, I think discernment, I like that word. Yeah. Discipline, <laughs> negative. Um, does that Be seem too controlling? Discipline? Yeah, because yeah. I find, you know, again, if I'm too controlling of myself, if I have a strong goal or an outcome, as I've said, in my life, I usually never get there. It's really when I lose myself and all of my stuff <laughs> that I end up having an experience that I may not have known but is the right experience for me. Mm. And there's this great psychoanalyst, his name is Christopher Bolas, and he uses the term unthought known. Mm. And so I think when I go into these spaces and I just kind of let go, there's probably an unthought known there that gets discovered in the process. So I think re critical reflection is always something that uh, if you want to use the word discipline, that's my discipline that I have to try to have that in my life. Yeah. Um, but it's more, you know, I'm a social worker. We're in that space between applying theory to practice. And so I'm constantly doing experiments in the process and thinking about them. Once I start doing outcomes, it's all over. So discipline, negative. <laughs> Thinking, being thoughtful, yes. Yeah. D my son's in the front row, so don't, don't say that too much. Yeah. Discipline's fine. Um, so this question is, uh, many, many companies and brands embrace like diversity initiatives in their mission statements, um, but I don't think this person is wondering, they don't think that they see age um, as being always included in that, and should it be? Well, here's the interesting thing. I've been seeing a lot more of age being included, and unfortunately, it's because all of a sudden, because all of the millennials are writing about how they don't have money, that they finally realize that older people have money. <laughs> so, so now they're you know, really kind of targeting us. But the, tar <laughs> the, the targeting us is disingenuous. And, you know, part of that is because the vision of, of age that is being represented now, um, to me, is a dangerous one. And I think initially we had to really go overly positive on the age because there was so much ageism and so much negative representation. But now I think we've gone too far. Mm. And I think that we have this, you know, you start seeing it now, this ageless, fit, buff, highly resourced, 
you know, do, totally independent, running a marathon at 90, doesn't need a thing, in contrast to the other end of the spectrum, which is the decline narrative, where you're going to be disabled, and you're going to have dementia, and you're a drain on society. And the reality is the 90% of older people are in the middle. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that are not being represented in this new version that media and brands and everybody is taking on when they say, oh, look, we're including age. And this is my favorite example. I just have to share it. Like that show, The Golden Bachelor. I knew what they were up to in the very first episode. I should have led with this question, just what do you think of the golden bat? Yeah. Because, <laughs> because they said it all in that very first right, episode. They had, so you have all of these women, very fit, looking young, very vibrant. One of them's even, you know, doing this in her birthday suit. And all of a sudden, a limo pulls up, and there is a woman with gray curly hair, a house dress, she has a walker, and the bachelor, and she's inching towards the bachelor. Oh, no. And the bachelor very disingenuously says, oh, can I help you? And all of a sudden, she throws I off the wig, throws off the house dress, throws away the walker. Yeah, she's got a strapless dress. She's so buff and so hot. And she says, do I look like I need any help? <laughs> and for me, as an older person, that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that is a warning, right? That is a powerful message about how people think we should age. And that vision of aging is an incredibly privileged yeah. vision of aging. And that's why I'm saying most of us, and I put myself there now because I'm on a fixed income, um, is in that middle. And we have all these great things about being old, but there's a lot of things about being old that suck. And we have to be honest about it. And I think how despairing is it for these younger women who are starting to say, oh, I'm sick of laboring on my appearance. I am sick of these standards that I have to live up to, that we are showing 70 and 80 year old women doing that, putting, mm -hmm. because I can tell you my metabolism is in the toilet. <laughs> and for me to look like those women, I would have to be putting in four hours a day. Yeah. And I have four hours to do something that I think is more important than spending time and money on how I look. Yeah. So I think we have to really start getting a more balanced representation and show more people who really are the aging people in our country so that policymakers and innovators can design for us mm -hmm. and can mm -hmm. give us support when we need it. Because there are times you're yeah. going to need it. And I want young women to stop spending that money on all of those things, put it in a good account, and when you're 70, honey, that's going to be a lot of money. My son really loves that. Yeah. That's, yes, that's amazing. Well, um, I think we'll just ask you one last question. Now, I mean, nothing beats that, but we'll just ask you one last question. Um, and this question sort of dovetails what, what something I thought would be my last question is you talk about in your book and the blog that there's um, a state of what nowness, and I love the way that you describe that what nowness in in your blog. And then this question from the audience says, "Your brilliance, your strength, your style, you've always been an inspiration for me. So what's next for Dr. Slater?" So yeah, what's now? Well, I'm kind of doing it, yeah, right? I'm, as the woman said, 
I'm a published memorist. You. Woo. <laughs> so, yeah. So I will be in love with my sub stack. <laughs> That's what is next for me. And continuing to, um, my editor is actually here, but she has our, the editor of our local newspaper has graciously allowed me to have a monthly column. Wow. So Amazing. I'm super excited about that and embedded. We have a lot of artists in our community and um, doing things with them and hanging out and figuring out the what now. But it's going to be in Peekskill and my grandchildren are going to be right with me and my partner and my family and my garden. And that's where I'm at. And I'm kind of now in... Okay, I'm putting myself in peak skill. I'm going to see, like, what's going to happen. But the very next thing you're going to be doing is signing books <laughs> right over there. So there's books for sale here. Yeah. Look at this. Yeah. <laughs> I want to thank everyone for coming. There's books for sale here, and then Lynn and I both will be over here. And yeah, do you say anything? Thank you. I just want to thank you so much. You've made this such a special day for me. <laughs> thank you. And I absolutely need to bow down to Chloe because I was a basket case this morning. <laughs> and she basically said, I've got you. And she sure did. So thank you, Chloe. <laughs> <laughs>